This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Carberline. If you're a scientist and you make an important discovery, how do you spread the word? For that, you're going to need media. Television, radio, newspapers, and the web. So how do you actually do that? How do you get people to understand what you've seen? Today we're going to talk with Mike Johansson, Senior Lecturer of Communications at Rochester Institute of Technology, about how you communicate news and how you can compete for attention in a world with diverse media. So if I understand correctly, your background is in communications, particularly journalism and newspapers? Yes, yes. Uh, 25 plus years, uh, mostly in newspapers in New Zealand, Australia, and here in the United States. First five and a half years as a reporter and the rest as an editor. One of the things I've noticed in, in my own experience when I mostly do blog stuff, so I'm trying to communicate scientific ideas, but on the online media. And there are times when it's very easy to get disheartened. So, you know, you'll see things with link bait headlines and things that are incorrect that start getting spread over the, the news and, you know, something goes viral and then you have to try and counter it. And there's, there's all of these challenges and problems that, that, that you seem to come up against. And one of the central things that I wanted to try and ask about is how do you deal with this? How do you communicate well or clearly in a world in which everybody has a short attention span and they're looking at cats on their phone? It's the old push and pull. It's been around ever since any kind of media has been out there. You're trying to get people's attention. So you do need to do things that will grab people's attention. Um, and the, the simple answer is that over time, people figure out that the, the, the New York Post, for example, uses headlines that, that exaggerate wildly. And that's what they expect from the New York Post. But the internet is so relatively young that it's, people are still taking almost everything they see on the web uh, verbatim. It takes them a while to figure out that uh, TMZ, for example, is you know as often wrong as it is right. Or you know Gawker tends to uh, exaggerate. BuzzFeed tends to focus on one little detail out of hundreds. It takes a while for the audience and the, the medium to mature. To get back to the question, how do you stand out and how do you take care of issues when they show up? Well, one is just keep pointing out to people that XYZ site doesn't have it right. The headline's not based on the story. The story's not based on the science. So, uh, so the fighting back idea. That yeah, they it, come in and then you attack them. <laughs> Well, you attack it, but you just keep pointing it out. Just keep chipping away at it. And that can be a long and slow process. Another thing to do is to um, try and uh, get a, a sort of a horde of people on your side, if you like, to uh, jump into the fray in the comments area. You know, great story. Okay. Wish it was based on the science. That kind of thing. <laughs> uh, here's, here's a link to the real science. Um, and if you do that often enough, uh, people will see that XYZ site isn't to be trusted when it comes to a science story, for example. It is a challenge. Uh, you do need to get attention in the first place. And one of the things that's missing a lot in journalism, and I, I suspect in the blogging world a lot, is sort of the uh, professional editor approach, if you like. Mm -hmm. In other words, the editor's job traditionally is to find out, make the story as good as it can be, make it as interesting as possible, best facts, most interesting facts at the top and inverted pyramid kind of style. Right. But it's all got to be accurate. And then come up with a headline that not only encapsulates what the story is about, but makes you say, hey, Martha, I've got to read this right now. I don't care if I'm late for the bus or I'm late for the train or whatever. I've got to stop and read this right now. Right. And that's the challenge. What you've got on the web, though, is far too many people who are just throwing out headlines, as you say, clickbait. Ten things about the sun. You will not believe number five. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, have to see what the celebrity did with their swimsuit or that right. kind of, yeah, yeah. There are certain, there's all kinds of websites and blog posts out there that talk about, you know, ways to make sure you have a clickable headline. Right. And they all come down to sort of the same things that advertisers have known forever. Numbers work, questions work, challenging people to you won't believe this or this seems in part this is impossible but it's true that kind of very sensationalistic like the new york post right <laughs> perhaps right. um like a lot of tabloids they're in the business of just grabbing attention almost at the cost of 
anything else. But look at what we think about when we think about tabloids, supermarket tabloids and uh, the, the New York Post. You know, we don't hold them in very high esteem. So the other part of this is, do we want to spend a lot of time and effort straightening things out on some sites when they get it wrong? Right. Or do we, do we want them just to sink into the morass of the web? I know in my own experience, uh, the, the blog posts for me that are the most popular are the ones where either I'm pointing out someone else's mistake or I'm griping about the state of what people are doing. <laughs> so it's, it's the frustrated posts that become the absolute most popular. They're the ones that go viral, which is, is frustrating because, you know, I want to talk about the real science. That's where you need to tap into sort of an editor. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that editors forever, and I know I had this experience myself, dealing with, particularly with younger reporters, was they'd come back with a ton of information and have a hard time sometimes distilling what's the what's the most interesting nugget here, what's the hook, the thing that's going to grab someone's attention, the the frosting that gets people to eat the whole cake. And, and you have to think about it in those terms. And, and, you know, you don't ever want the frosting to be misleading. Right. You know, you don't want lime frosting necessarily on chocolate cake, but... They have to work together, you know, and they, they have to, one has to reflect the other kind of thing. Right. And in, as a scientist, it, very, it feels somewhat kind of antithetical to science. You know, it's like we, we hate these link bait titles. We hate the idea of, you know, here's a wild claim and we want to make the cautious statement. We want to make the, the evidence statement, which is not what necessarily anybody will read. Well, but I think there's a happy medium there. You, you need to sort of figure out... Do you want people to read it at all? Mm -hmm. And that's, honestly, you know, I've, I've seen some academic papers that almost scream, don't read me. <laughs> you know, there's a 35-word title. You know, there's a, the, the, the synopsis underneath is a 67-word paragraph. It's a single sentence, but it's right. 67 words. And it just says, I'm doing it this way because I don't want you to really read me. I'm, right. I'm getting some kind of grant to do this work. I'm going to put it out, but I'm hoping no one reads it. Well, that's actually a big thing. I mean, in, in <laughs> science, you'll have a, a well-read paper might have 20 readers. Yeah. So if you actually write a research paper and 20 people read it and one person cites it, you've won. You know, yeah. that's, that's a success in science. And in journalism, that would be an abysmal failure. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. And, and, but somewhere in there, there's, there is a happy medium. Um, you know, if, if I could do anything to, I think, improve... Uh, people's general impression of academics, it would be to help them understand that doing the research and writing the paper is not the end game. Okay. The end game is getting more people to understand why your, what you found in your research is important and how it relates to real world issues, real world problems, how it relates to me. One of the concepts I teach in all of my public relations and advertising classes is everyone's favorite radio station is WIIFM. What's in it for me? And we're all self-interested. We only pay right. attention to things that we have an interest in. Sometimes it's enlightened self-interest, but it is self-interest. We, right. we, we think we're too busy to spend time on things that don't have any value to us. Right. So therefore, you've got to very quickly, in five or ten words in a headline, on the web, on a paper, wherever, you've got to be able to convey to someone why they need to stop what they're doing and pay attention to this. Right. And you see some of that now in, t in terms of funding. So, for example... The National Science Foundation and other organizations, when you put in a proposal, part of what you have to do now is to describe how you're going to communicate this beyond academia. And that's part of it. But there's still kind of an attitude of, oh, yeah, that's the other thing that I have to do that has nothing to do with science. Here's what I would argue is that if science is just off doing its own little research and off doing its own little thing, and it's not being conveyed to the great unwashed masses what science is doing, what is the value of that? And where will the money for future funding for grants come from if no one sees value in what's going on over here in science that right. they're too busy being scientists to be bothered telling the rest of the world what they're actually doing? This is One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Coberline. We've been talking with Mike Johansson about how to communicate science in a world of media. Up next, we'll talk about how media has changed and how we can adapt to it. So you've been in this field for, what, 25 years? Oh, more. More Actually, than 25 yeah. years, okay. An apprentice right out of high school in 19, December 1977. 
Okay, so it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, you've seen things. You've seen yeah. this game change. Oh, absolutely. And uh, a lot of things have changed. The technology, obviously, have changed. The way we get our news, the way it's printed, that kind of thing. Uh, the web, obviously, cell phones and smartphones and, and all the rest of it. But uh, what hasn't changed is the, the, the need for the news to get found. Um, that's, and this is a big debate in journalism, particularly, is that up until the web, the news had to find a way to get found. In other words, it had to be distributed in something. Right. A lot a more medium p- that had to actively go out there. Right. Now, with smartphones, uh, we almost have an expectation as consumers that the news will find us. Is there like a difference between push and pull? Yeah, or? absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So media was very much push, going all the way back to the early newspapers, early magazines, advertising on billboards and posters and so forth. Gutenberg. Yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. It was push. You, you put it down and you... You hand it to someone, you deliver it to someone. Um, With smartphones and the web, we can set up RSS feeds, we can set up alerts, we can follow a Twitter feed or make a Twitter list of people who share good stuff, and the news finds us. Mm -hmm. And that's a big change. In that world, the latter world here, where news has to find us, sometimes things that rise to the top of that are the things that have those grabby headlines or have the things that really gra- scream for attention. Right. Or The more sensational the headline, the more people are going to grab onto it. Yeah. I mean, uh, the Facebook algorithm, for example, is set up so that um, when I log into Facebook, I see things that I've indicated an interest in according to Facebook's algorithm. So the people I have reacted to the most, the posts I've reacted to the most... Um, and the topics I've reacted to the most, pretty much in that order. No one knows the, the way the exact algorithm works. Right. But if I don't react to you on Facebook for a couple of months, I'm just going to stop seeing your stuff until for some reason your birthday comes up or something, you pop right. back up. Right. You get pushed down. And that type of thing, it happens in Google search. It happens, you know, it's the sort of popularity contest mentality really is everywhere on the web. Right. And, yeah. And it seems like it's more of a narrowing of the scope. In other words, that the winners continually win in that sense. So the people that you like more or, or view more get on your screen more and are therefore more likely to get another like or a share from you again. Right. And it's going to get worse. Facebook just announced a couple of weeks ago, you can now go into your feed and say, these are the five people I want to, everything they do, I want to make sure it shows up at the top of my feed. Right. Here are 10 more people I'd like to know about when they post. And so you can self-selecting, um, there's, a, there's a lot of political theory around this, why you know the government has become so polarized is because you can listen to a conservative radio station, because all your friends and your social networks can all be conservatives, you really start to get a, a worldview because you're surrounding yourself with just like-minded people. Right. And, and there is true a, with any group. You can you can build this kind of echo chamber and sure. you think the entire world thinks like you. Right. And it, it, even if the people you're surrounding with represent 10% of the population or 15 but whatever it is. What is interesting, though, is there was research that came out, I believe it was last year, reported on NPR, Shankar Verdantam. He reported on social science uh, a couple of studies that found that even though people are surrounding themselves with like-minded uh, points of view, they're actually still unable to avoid contrary points of view. And that even if you do nothing but listen to conservative radio, go to conservative websites, you still cannot avoid being exposed to opposing points of view. Because at the very least, people are going to gripe about it. Right. right. <laughs> and, so, and so there is some hope that you still will not be able to be in a complete bubble of your own point of view. So I think one of the things you talked about in terms of how we see media, you, were, you, you said before we were having the conversation, you can break people up into skimmers, dippers and divers, is yes, that right? Yeah. So back in the day, I was working for a large media corporation here in America. I was on a committee that was looking at you know how the web might change things. And one of the things we decided was that if we were putting together a Peterson's Field Guide to Birds, and that if all web users were birds, they'd be categorized as skimmers, dippers, and divers. Skimmers being the people that call up, do a search in Google, and they just read the headlines and the search results. Um, they'll often be the ones that go to a second page of results. Not too many people do that, but they will. Dippers are the people who will read the headline and they'll read some of those highlighted paragraphs, the, the, the key, the key like the block of text. The first paragraph of an article. That shows up, it. and it's still in the search results. They're still in the search results page, 
but they're actually reading just a little bit more. And then the divers are the people who actually click on a link and spend at least 30 seconds reading actual content. And the somewhat disheartening thing at the time, although I believe this is still true, is our very unscientific survey found that 80 to 85% of people doing Google search are the skimmers. Mm-hmm. And they will, they will just skim, 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 and they may dive into one result. Another 10 to 15 are dippers, and somewhere around 5% or a little less are actually divers, the people that will actually go deep into something on the web. So if you're producing content for the web, what you have to do is get skimmers to become divers. And the only way you do that is a headline that grabs attention, that key paragraph that really scintillates, excites, makes you stop you doing whatever whatever else distracts you from whatever else you were going to do and gets you to dive into the content. Right. I know in like press releases, one of the things they'll do is the rule of 33300. The first three words, if they hook a reader, will get them to read the next 30. And the next 30 will get them to read the next 300. Yeah. And that's kind of how it has to be. You need that headline and then those first few words. Sure. Well, in journalism, we used to say if you're writing a story about a house fire, the first word needs to be fire. <laughs> fire destroyed, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so in science, all of our first words needs to be science. <laughs> yes. Well, or maybe yeah. quantum or something. Or asteroid, or asteroid or sunspot. Or, yeah. Right. Understanding that at the same time as a scientist, I kind of recoil from that. It's just, it's like the absolute worst that you want in terms of trying to communicate something about a scientific idea because they're not catchphrases. They're not lolcats in that sense. And you see this a lot in places like Facebook where, you know, someone will make a pretty picture with some inspirational quote that's wrong, but it gets shared 4,000 times as opposed to, you know, an actual paragraph that'll get shared 20. And it, it seems very disheartening as, as a scientist. <laughs> One of the things as a reporter you have to do is decide what's the nut graph, what's the key to the story. Write that paragraph out. That won't be your first paragraph. That's the paragraph that tells everyone what the story is about. Before you get to that, you've got to have, here's the thing that really matters. And is like you say, the 30 words that are going to draw you in. What would you say to someone if you were sitting on a bar stall and they said, what's the story you're working on today? 30 words or less. And if you can't say 30 words or less, you haven't thought about it enough. I'm sure in lots of scientific fields, the, the, the idea of boiling down something to 30 words or less is pretty scary. It's terrifying. It's downright yes. terrifying. <laughs> but as an editor, I can tell you that even the most complex stories, one of the things I always used to say is I think I was a good editor because I think I'm one of the dumbest guys I know. <laughs> because when you're, when you're dumb, you ask lots of questions. And the more you ask questions, the easier it is to boil something down to something that's manageable. So, so that's our headline. The key to good journalism, be stupid. <laughs> yeah. The key to being a good editor. Being a good editor. <laughs> yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, there's nothing that can't be boiled down to 30 words. And there's no, there isn't a 30-word sentence that can't be boiled down to 25, to 20, to 15, and so on. At some point, when you have a very complex idea, you may reach a point of no return where you're taking out one more word really will take away something very important. But the challenge, I think, for anyone is to be able to say something in 30 words or less. And if you really can't do that, think of yourself at a dinner party and someone says, what are you working on? If you launch into a 200-word explanation, they're immediately going to start talking to everyone else at the table because they realize you can't distill what it is you're working on that's exactly what we do though (laughs) well actually i'm kind of working on this so that's it's like you're all in your own little world you look up why where did they go (laughs) well and um i think as we were talking earlier you know where does the funding for a lot of this research come from a lot of it's taxpayer dollars so in the world of science i think it behooves science to do a good job of being able to tell the world what it's working on and in a, in a language that the everyday person understands. I think one of the things that sep- has probably caused a, um, a bit of a gap between science, if you like, and the average person is people feel like they no longer understand the more complex notions of science. Mm-hmm. You know, this recent announcement uh, here in Rochester about Photonics Institute. Right. It's a big deal. I was screaming at the radio for two days. All I wanted was someone to put in one sentence what What is photonics. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And they finally did it. And I went, hallelujah. I'm literally, I'm driving down an expressway going, hallelujah. They finally in one sentence managed to drop in the nut graph, 
what photonics is right and that's all they had to do all along and it's you know it's frustrating when they can't do that or won't do that and in terms of you know the science approach we want to go into the details rather than the summary and it's it's one of the things that you know working with with outreach the phrase that kept coming back was accuracy is more important than precision the idea that the the short summary that's an accurate summary of what this is is more important than having all the details sure well think of it as a meal if you sat down in a restaurant and they bought the all-you-can-eat buffet and dumped it in front of you right away and said, isn't this great? You'd be like, oh, give them the appetizer. Work their way up to the soup. Work your way up to the salad. Work your way up so that people, they will consume as much as they want, as much as they're able. Right. But if you throw the whole smorgasbord at them at once, they're just gonna have, you'll have them throwing up their hands and sort of saying, this is too much. And I think that's something I think is a long tradition in journalism is give the story in pieces. Sure. The idea that you, you give a short story for some people and not everyone's going to go past that. And then, and then you give a longer story. And, and we, do, we tend to take the approach of I have to give you the complete picture and the complete story all in one get go, which nobody reads. Which is the equivalent of take your medicine and it's good for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're listening to One Universe at a Time. We've been talking with Mike Johansson about the evolution of media and science communication. Up next, I want to ask about who gets to do all of this, the scientists or the journalists? So one of the questions that comes to mind is, as a scientist, if I want to communicate the ideas, it seems like I need to learn these skills. It's one more thing that I need to learn. And I think, as you put it, do I need to cozy up with an editor? Heck yeah. (laughs) Um, I, I think it's one of those things that I think almost any profession, science, any engineers, uh, anyone that works in a field that is outside the scope of the, what the average person is exposed to probably could use the help of a good editor um, in terms of helping them understand not just layman's term and languages, but actually how to sort of boil things down to that compact consumable snack of information that sort of gets you to want to take the next big bite and the next bite and so on. Yeah. Okay. I know in a lot of uh, the, the kind of standard format in science is that if I have a research paper, then if I want to communicate it to the general public, the next step would be to take it to the news service and every department or college has a news service. You hand it to them and you say, okay, make it hit the press. And that, that's as far as it goes for me. Yeah. And which is, Probably okay, but I'm guessing that, you know, those poor people, and I say poor people because I, I can't imagine what it's like to receive 20 or 30 of those a year and have to read them and distill them down, not really having the per- the author there to help explain what's going on. Right. I, I think probably a better thing would actually be to have a discussion, a back and forth. Mm-hmm. Tell me in 30 words what your, what your research found. Right. And if you can't do you just keep working at it. Tell me in 30 words, what did you find? What was the key finding? What was the most interesting thing? What was the most surprising thing? What's, how is this going to change X? With that back and forth discussion, this is how editors and reporters work all the time. Mm-hmm. So think of the editor and think of the reporter being the scientist or the researcher. And having that back and forth, a nice healthy back and forth, before actually any writing gets done. The other thing is I would love it, really, if... Every researcher in the world took a class like the one I happen to teach here at RIT, which is called <laughs> PR writing, which is basically it's journalism with a strategic purpose. Okay. And it teaches you the inverted pyramid, you know, the most important fact followed by the next most important, the next most, and so on, so that people can consume what they have time and capability to consume and still get the important information. They may not get it all to the researcher's satisfaction. But frankly, if they want that, they can always go to the research paper. Right. So it seems like scientists should also be cub reporters. In a sense. In a (laughs) sense. Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, I think particularly the scientists who want to make a name for themselves, not for the sake of making a name for themselves, but jumping to the head of the line the next time grants are being given out or the next time, you know, collaborations are coming up. Oh, yeah, you're the guy that gets picked up in XYZ publications, you're well known. And I see it happen around this campus all the time because those people are a little bit more PR savvy. 
And because of that, um, they tend to sort of jump ahead of others who may be more talented researchers, may be doing more important work, but all they're doing is taking their research paper, dumping it on someone's desk and saying, I don't understand why no one wants to pay attention to this. Right, right. <laughs> why aren't they reading this in this, this thing yeah. in nature that you know costs lots of money to read? I think the other part is you see there are a lot of scientists now who are becoming much more active in social media. So they're active participants on Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus or something like that. And there's kind of a movement, I think, among some scientists, maybe younger scientists, the idea of being active in your own connection to the general public. And and it's not necessarily just about your own research, but there seems to be some evidence that that can actually help the more you're known in social media, you know, the more your stuff's going to get read. And I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we've gone from a... Uh, a media-centric society in the 20th century to the 21st century where it's, we're much more democratic. Anyone can connect with anyone, which is what I love about social media. Mm-hmm. I can have a one-to-one conversation with Ellen DeGeneres. Right. I can have a one-to-one conversation with uh, the president, theoretically. And that's the wonderful thing about social media. And I think scientists should take advantage of that. You know, the, the, the one big plus of social media is that you can get that one-to-one going and you can actually build your own community. And one of the things that I would think, for example, researchers might want to do is build a community of interest around a research topic they care about. You see lots of people building community around social media marketing, which is a, a field sort of I partially teach in. Right. And so someone like a Seth Godin, who's legendary in, in marketing... <laughs> has this huge community of several million people. And every time he writes anything, it gets shared by 100,000 people. It do- doesn't matter whether he, he, you know... Here's a picture he, of my dog and that's several well, thousand Well, yeah, people. or he thought of something while he was eating his Cheerios. You know, it becomes a thing because Seth Godin said it. Right. And that's, again, it's that notoriety. It's being known. It's, it's, it, social media can definitely help with that. I guess I would caution people to think about it more in terms of engagement. You don't want to be on it for the sake of being on it. But if you can get people interested in what you're doing, get feedback from those people, maybe feed them a few little snippets of what you're finding and what you're doing and, and get them to react to that. You also have better use it as a way to take the pulse of, you know, I found these five things in my research, but this one thing, this one thing really seems to excite people. For the piece that goes out to the public, that's my lead. That's, that's the lead. headline. Yeah. That's the thing that's going to get attention because it's exciting people on social media. So like reader testing it with your small group. In a way, yeah. You sort of, yeah. Yeah, there. reader testing, yeah. Do you think it, that we, we kind of lose something? I mean, I think it's a common idea among science that if you're going to engage in, you know, outreach or you're going to engage in science communication that you're, you're kind of dumbing it down. It, it, it's this idea that you've lost something that scientists should be focusing purely on the science. I absolutely, of course, scientists should be focusing on the science. And the people who say that you're dumbing it down, think of it, flip that on its head. No, you're actually trying to raise other people up. You shouldn't have to necessarily aim it at that that mythical, what is it, eighth grade reading level. But you should be able to explain it in terms that anyone reading it can get excited, as excited as you are about the science. Okay. And if you can't do that, Take a class. <laughs> yeah. right. Public speaking, PR Public writing. Speaking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, learn ways that you can communicate what you're doing so that you can you know, get other people excited so they want to tell other people. If you get 10 pe- people so excited, they tell 10 more people, they tell 10 more people, really they're starting to do the PR for you. All right, the idea of going viral, that, that you get more impact than you would. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little leery yeah. of the term going viral, yeah. but, yes, yeah. but, but yes, it spreads sort of naturally because people got excited and you you started that fire with one little spark but to do that you've got about to put it in terms that everyone can understand right. and it doesn't mean dumbing it down it just means using language that everyone understands right and it sounds like it would be beneficial just in general in that sense and that uh, you know if i promote an, a scientific idea that i have getting that excitement in my field then makes it easier for someone else in my field to garner that excitement because they've seen other things like it. So it it all kind of connects together and builds upon itself. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things I love about 
teaching where I teach here at RIT is that we sort of have this pervasive geek culture, which I, <laughs> I absolutely love being a part of, um, because I'll see something weird and geeky and I'll share it. And, you know, all of a sudden there's 30 or 40 other weird geeky people at RIT here who are all like, that's cool, that's cool. And they start sharing and mentioning and talking. And that's kind of a cool thing. So in all the years that you've seen media change in the communication, are you optimistic about where we're going? Well, I'm always optimistic. I'm, I'm a, you know, glass half full, glass can always be refilled kind of guy. Yeah, I, I think what ha- has happened is this evolution of media. My, my theory on, on media is that what happened in the 20th century was an aberration. In other words, big companies, centrally controlled media is an aberration. If you go back before the, the start of corporate-owned newspapers, before radio, before TV, media consisted of the town crier. It was people sharing stuff in the village square. Um, it was people writing letters. The co- coffee shops during the revolution. Yeah, and yeah. so uh, that was a sort of very democratic way of sharing information, news, and so forth. And we went to this thing during the 20th century, late 19th century, 20th century, where it was sort of the, the power to do that was concentrated by the people who could run the printing presses, the people who could you know print the magazines, run the radio and the TV stations. And there was this thing that media was, you know, was them, not us. Mm-hmm. I think we're going back much more to media as us. And I think that's a very good thing. What we have to figure out, though, is how we discern quality from the great broiling mass of stuff that's <laughs> out there. You've been listening to One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Corberline. We've been talking with Mike Johansson about the science of communication. One Universe at a Time is produced by Mark Gillespie at the Rochester Institute of Technology with support by the RIT College of Science. Thanks for listening. Thank you.